heard in the coming of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. We'll begin this morning with verse 13. Those that are able to stand with me in reference to reading the God's holy, infallible, and erring, and inspired word. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Either ye enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do many gather the grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit, it is home or cut down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Verse 21. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them that I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Verse 27, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Father, in the name of Jesus, please bless the reading of your word, please bless the preaching of your word. And God, we just look to you to do the impossible, Lord, a God that is very possible with you. Since Jesus Christ holy, in precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If I were to title a message this morning, I would call it Prove It or Lose It. Prove It or Lose It. Now we're talking about things of spirituality. Now we're not talking about a loss of salvation. I don't really want you to confuse that. But, you know, you've got to prove it or you've got to lose it sometimes. We could say a bet. We could say... Some of you young boys, y'all made a lot of bets this week as we've been around the rise talking about how you are. Justice was talking about these two girls. We never found them anywhere and that we're looking for him to give him his number. And we looked all over Dollywood and we looked all over the whole week, but he never found them. He said there were two girls that were really looked staring him down and wanted his number, but we couldn't ever find them. So you know what we did? We said, prove it. Where they at? Show us. I'm a man of facts, you know. I, it, it's good to hear what you can do and who you are and all that stuff. But it's a whole lot better when you really show me what you can do. Some of you might say, you know, I can slam a 10-foot goal. And you know what you do in high school when somebody says, yeah, I can do it. Throw them the ball and prove it. You know, in our life, there's, in every area, there's always that. In the workplace, in the job place, you always got somebody that's cocky or arrogant or somebody that just fly out lies to you. And they can do all of these magnificent things. And you know what you want to do? Show me. Don't tell me. It's the same thing with our Christian walk and in our Christian life. Is that even in the Christian life, it's more than just professing what we can do. It's more than just saying that we are a Christian. It's more than just saying that we know Jesus Christ. But when someone is truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, not only will they have profession, but they'll also have works to back that up. Amen. We're not talking about working to get your salvation, but when you get your salvation, I'll tell you, it'll put, it'll put a motorboat on your boat. Amen? Right. And what we're, we got a lot of that people today that has got a boat, but they ain't got no motor of faith. And when you've got a boat, but you ain't got a motor, it tells me there's something wrong with your motorboat. Amen? Not going anywhere. 
But what we need to understand, let me read to you 2 Corinthians in chapter 13 and verse 5 very quickly. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how did Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate? What's it? The Apostle Paul saying here, he is saying, uh, examine yourself, try yourself, look at you and evaluate your own heart, evaluate your own motives, evaluate your own life, evaluate your own works to prove to yourself whether you're in the faith or not. It shows us that there can be consistency in our hearts, there can be consistency in and even in our own walk, that sometimes we may even doubt ourselves if we're saved. But first of all, before you try to prove to anyone else, you've got to be able to prove to yourself a confidence that you are truly saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. What he say? He was saying in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, that if you can't prove to yourself, it's because you're reprobate. Reprobate means unsaved. Reprobate is a word that means not passing the test. So when you're examined, as you're examined in high school to see if you're going to graduate or not, when you're examined on the SAT and you make about a six something like I did, or you make a 1200 like I'm sure Carson and, and Zoe and all of you others did, that did great. A 600 is pretty low, by the way. I'm ashamed that I even told that, especially on Facebook. People are hearing that now. But I'm just saying it's because I didn't apply myself. I was way smarter. But there's always an examination, a test to prove whether you really are or you really are. And we need to examine ourselves by the Word of God to ensure that we really are what we say that we are. There is a lot of lost world out there today that if you were to move through Ori County, that everybody says, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I got baptized. Yes, I said a prayer. Yes, I did this. But you haven't been in church and you haven't even had any kind of works for many, many years. Man, I'm going to tell you, if there's no works, if there's nothing of proof there, you're just talking, but you ain't showing. Mm -hmm. We look and we see that here in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, what we see is what many call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, he goes forth and he has a, a mountainside there where many disciples come and they get on that hill. And he begins to speak forth. It would kind of probably been kind of like an amphitheater. So it was a real good environment where he could project his voice out and it would echo because he didn't have a sound system. And he didn't want to wear his voice out trying to talk to thousands of people. So God put him in a place where he could echo, his voice would echo and the people could hear as the voice rose through the air. And he was discipling his people. Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. But many call it the Beatitudes as well. Why? Because it teaches disciples how they're, what kind of attitude they're supposed to have, what kind of discipleship really looks like. And so if you want to know what Christ expected in discipleship, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 will be some good lessons for you to read through. What we see and understand here in Matthew chapter, uh, uh, third, uh, chapter 7 verse 13 through 14, I want you to see first of all uh, that if you're going to prove it or lose it, first of all, You've got to properly examine your way. You've got to properly examine your way. When we say way, we're talking about the path that you're on. It says in verse 13 of Matthew 7, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Did you add that word destruction? And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. What we need to understand is there really, there's really only two paths in life that you're taking. Oh, you can take career paths, you can take hobby paths, some would like hunting, some would like fishing, some would like shopping, some would like this and that. There's many different paths in life as far as socially what we're talking about, but ultimately there are only two paths that you and I are taking in life. And that is a, a path of righteousness and holiness, or it is a path of self-righteousness and unholiness. The, the unrighteous path is a broad road. It says there that it is a broad, it's a wide road, and it leadeth to destruction. 
if there's only too many results in a person's life, is that what they are li- walking and living in life is going to take them to destruction, or what they're walking and living in life is going to take them to eternal life. And friend, I'm going to tell you that the broad road is a road that leads to destruction. It's a road that's easy to walk. It's a road that most of the world is on. It's the road that most of religious people are on today because it's an easy road. It has no standards. It has no responsibility. It has no accountability. It is much of what we're seeing in a lot of the new contemporary slash charismatic movements today uh, that have no standards whatsoever. You can social drink. You can live a sinful life. And God's going to hang out with you. And it's going to be a good time. And we're going to high five. And we're going to hang out and be cool with God for a little while. Friend, I'm telling you, God is a good God. He loves you. He's closer than a brother. But He is a God of holiness, and He is a God to be reverent to and uh, reverent before. But what I'm telling you is this is not an easy-go-way kind of religion that Jesus is speaking. He's saying that this road of salvation is very narrow, and it's a hard, disciplined, regulated road. It's an easy road to get on, but you're going to, you can't do it in the flesh. The broad road is one that is easy for the flesh to walk. It's one that your natural desires can be fulfilled on a broad road. You can hang out, have a good time, do a good time, just live your life. But over here on this narrow road, when Christ really gets in you, is the only way to walk the narrow road is by living with the Holy Ghost inside of you, guiding your path when you begin to steer on. God's keeping you on that narrow road. You can't do that on your own. That's why you've got to have God and true salvation if you want to be on that narrow road because it is a disciplined road. And let me just tell you, you and I are not disciplined outside of the Holy Spirit chasing and working in our lives. It is impossible for someone to walk a narrow road who has not been transformed, regenerated inside uh, that God has come in and walk alive a spiritually dead person quicken their spirit. Now he lives inside of us. Like the little girl said one time, y'all heard me say it many times, little girl said, when a big God gets in a little person, he's going to stick out somewhere. I'm telling you, you'll see a change in a person. They'll walk differently because they're walking on a narrow road that is being powered by the Holy Spirit. Those who are walking on a wide road, even religious people who are on a wide road, are trying to live it by the flesh. They can't live on the narrow because they don't have the Holy Spirit of God working and operating. We have got to properly examine our way. Which way are you going? There are those who are lost as hogans go, who have never been saved, don't claim to be saved. They say, I don't care about church. I don't care about anything. You know what? They're on the broad road. And they're headed to a road of destruction because of their sinfulness. The sad thing is there are many religious people who go to church, they have never been saved or transformed, they not examine themselves properly. They go to church, they hang out, they do stuff, they maybe got dumped under water, maybe they uh, set a prayer, maybe, but they never really got true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was a lot of the religious crowd who were on the broad road, and what does that look like? It looks like a comfortable lifestyle. It looks like a casual lifestyle. It looks like a lifestyle that has no discipline, and the congregation in itself that is not saved will be very comforting, and it will be, it will be worldly driven in its missions, in its motives. And it probably won't uh, call everybody in for an hour worth of prayer on a Friday or Saturday night because that's not comfort to the soul. That's sacrifice. And there's a lot of religious crowd who don't believe in sacrifice of self today because they are trying to do religious things on a broad road that causes it's easy to the flesh because they have not the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. We need to properly examine our way because our way is going to lead us to eternal life or to eternal death. It's an important thing. Not only do we uh, properly examine our way, but we need to properly examine your spiritual leaders. You need to properly examine your spiritual leaders. Look at verse 15 through 20. Uh, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving looks. They're coming in deceptively. They're coming in disguise. Boy, they might, they might have a suit and tie on. They might have a, the right Bible. They might have a King James. Or they might have a leather Bible. Or something that looks right. 
They might come and dress according to your standards in your congregation. They might look like a preacher, but inwardly they've got wrong motives. I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to jump around and I hope it'll be all right. But I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of people that are not of the same faith of many of our churches today. There are many that are going into churches that don't believe uh, in Reformed theology. And there are preachers who are Reformed, reformed, the, uh, reformed theology who are trying to come in and kidnap churches and take what existing because they've got a bank account, or because they've got a facility. They don't want to go out and start their own church and their own, uh, with their own doctrine because it's not popular to start with around here. And then because they would have to build and work to build a ministry. So there are many people who are coming in with wrong beliefs that are hijacked in other congregations. There are preachers who are of unlike faith coming into Baptist churches or Church of Christ men. There are Baptists who are trying to go into Methodist churches and transform the people. Friend, I'm going to tell you, there are many that come in, not only with just doctrines of devils to take you to hell, but there are many today that are coming into congregations who don't believe like the congregation, and they come in to try to slowly change and manipulate the congregation. Believe. Friend, I'm going to tell you, if you don't believe like the church there, you just go start your church and start your own move and be man enough. And don't come and start corrupting in other denominations. Friend, I'm telling you what, I'm Baptist all the way, head to toe. Why? Because I was born that way? Yeah, but not because I believe the Bible and I've come to Bible Baptist convictions in my life. I'm not going in to try to transform somebody else. I'm preaching and teaching what God's given me. But what, what I'm telling you, I'm telling, trying to tell young preachers what I'm trying to do is you be faithful to who you are and what you are. And don't you go over there and start manipulating and coming in sleeping the slightly into some congregation to manipulate it. If they don't believe in a, a eternal salvation, don't you go over there and try to transform them so that when you be up front, you say, this is what I believe before I ever take that. That wasn't planned, but that's free to the Holy Ghost, amen? But that's some good wisdom and advice right there for somebody. But what I'm telling you today is there are many that will come in as wolves, verse 15. We need to examine your spiritual leader, verse 16. Why? Because you shall know them by their fruits. Do men go to grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? You don't go to apple tree and pick an orange. You don't go to, an, uh, to a grape vine and, and pick a prune. No, sir. Whatever the mind is, that's the fruit that it's going to produce. Uh, even so, verse 17, every good tree produces good fruit. And then every corrupt fruit bringing forth evil fruit. And uh, what is he saying and telling us within these verses? He's telling us that we need to examine our spiritual leader. Why? Because it is such an important way that your ways is going to take you to eternal life or it's going to take you to eternal death. And upon both of these roads, on the religious side and on the safe side, there are leaders who are going to help and assist you on your walk to eternal life or to eternal death. The way, the path, the road that you are on, yes, you're making decisions. You've got a Bible that will help you and take you. But also along the way, God has given preachers and evangelists and teachers to help you along the way to get you on the road. And I want to tell you, there's preachers on both roads. There's preachers on the right road taking people to heaven. There's preachers on the wrong road taking people to the devil's hell. And the church steeples look the same. The building looks the same. The design looks the same. The clothing looks the same. But friend, I want to tell you, the motives are completely different. And you and I need to examine who we are following, who we're listening to. So what uh, if you get on Facebook and you can and YouTube and you can listen to some great preachers, and I, I hope that you'll listen to some Adrian Rogers. Write that down and start Googling Adrian Rogers. I hope you'll listen to some Jerry Vines. I hope you'll listen to some great men of God like C.T. Townsend and, and, and Jerry Dixon and many of those things that we know today. But friend, I'm going to tell you, you better be sure who you listen to because there's many doctrines out there and you don't want to get tangled up in the wrong thing. You need to evaluate and properly examine, examine the spiritual leaders who are helping take you down the road because you might start out on the right road and that thing take a shortcut in a whole broad road. You need to examine me as your pastor. How are you going to examine me? How are you going to examine your preacher? First of all, you know it by their fruits. How do I act when we're down at a rise? How do I act when I'm outside of the church fellowship? When we're out there, Brother Gary, we're digging, you need to be examining the certain thing. Boy, don't do it too close so that I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm going to say things I shouldn't. Boy, don't examine me too close. But you can see the eternal motives. If I'm out there and, and, and girls is coming by and you're up there staring and lust and care, something wrong with a man. When a man is more worried about his appearance and everything about him, and I'm not against jail here and all that, but I'm trying to give you an illustration. When they're so worried about their appearance that their spiritual part goes lacking, you better be careful. 
You need to examine the leaders that you're listening to. You need to examine the different churches where you're going. I'm just going to tell you, I believe in faithfulness to the house of God. I believe in faithfulness to the church. I think you ought to lock in and stay faithful as God as long as God leads you there. But I'm telling you today, here even in Horry County, there's a lot of good old country boys saved, country boys and country girls who are being faithful to ministries that God told them to leave a long time ago because it's believing wrong, it's doing wrong, and the pastor is not feeding the sheep, and they're just hanging around dying spiritually because they're under their own leadership. Friend, I want to tell you that we need to examine our leadership in the midst of this because there are two ways and they lead to two end results in your life. And that's very important that you need to be very cautious of who you listen to and who you follow. Say it in there. But what we see is we need to properly examine your way. You need to properly examine your spiritual leaders. But thirdly, you need to see in verses 21 uh, through 23 and actually all the way down to 29, that we need to properly examine your own motives. You need to properly examine your own motives. Look at verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that, what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I think you better prove it or you just might lose what you thought you had, not what you really had. You see, there's a lot of people that think they have something. There's a lot of guys out there that think they can do it. They some of y'all young boys that think y'all are the most gorgeous thing that has ever walked the face of the earth. I know it. I see it. Boy, y'all can turn your head around backwards and you'll hold it down. I see it. I see you struggling when you're sitting down, just fooling yourself. You think your girls are looking at you. And I'm over there looking at some of y'all and I'm saying, look at this jump right here. This, this thing is not pretty, but it thinks he is Elvis Presley back in the 60s walking around. But, but friend, what am I telling you? Not everything that you think you are is really what you are. And if you don't prove it, you're going to really lose what you thought you had, not what you really had. we got to properly examine our own motives. Why? Because he says that not everyone that says Lord, Lord. Do you see that they're using capital Lord, capital Lord twice, and they're saying, they're with emphasis, they're saying Lord, Lord. That's why we say it two times in the Bible. It's because it puts emphasis on the message, on the sentence that's being spoken. They are calling him Lord as if he is their Lord. Lord, Lord. And he's saying that even just because they call me Lord, Lord, they're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And let me tell you that it's not because God's doing something wrong or being mean. It's because the ones that thought he was Lord, Lord have been deceived. They've been deceived. Why? They've been deceived by the false leaders in verses 15 through 20. And they've been led, they've been led astray by the false way in verses 13 and 14. Because people that are on the, way, the broad way are going to tell you it's all right. They're going to say you ain't got to go to church all the time. You ain't got to be separated from the world. You ain't got to dress modestly. You ain't got to live holy. You ain't got to abstain from certain things in life. Just hang out with us. You're saved and just enjoy your grace. And just move on with us and do whatever your heart pleases. Many are going to get to that day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, and the Lord's not going to know them. Why? Because they had not examined truly their way. They had not examined their leaders. And here they had not even examined their own motives. You and I need to understand that we need to have the right motives for, uh, for uh, our relationship with God and in our Christianity. But we don't come to, for status position. There are preachers today, I'm sad to say, good old country preachers that are going to die and bust hell wide open. Why? Because they never truly examined their own motives. They were born in a Christian family, and they were raised in a Christian family, and they were told this is what you need to do, and this is a good thing to do. And maybe they dress right, maybe they lived even a good life, but they never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Friend, it, it is, salvation is not by works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, It is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm telling you, it don't matter if you preach the rest of your life, or you teach the rest of your life, or you sing the rest of your life, or you hang out in church the rest of your life. Friend, it's going to take an internal change to change you. And that is when you repent of your sins and by faith trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
There are a lot of young men that got married and they followed their wives to church. And their wife was a saved individual, loved the Lord, and they were just a kind of a follower type, wanted to please everybody. And they're, that, that's a, a hard personality to have when we're talking about salvation because there are people who just want to mold it and please everybody around them. And there are people in ministries today that wear the right clothes, have the right standards, do the right things. They're thankful because they want to please a wife, a spouse, a preacher, a friend, a, a church, family. But they've never had an internal change inside because they have never repented of their sins and by faith trusted Jesus Christ as their first Lord and Savior. They've never made it Lord and said, Lord, be Lord of my life. Uh, we've got to examine our internal motives because there will be some that think they are saved and will call him Lord, Lord. And he will, they will not enter to the kingdom of heaven, but only he that what doeth the will. And we're not talking about working for salvation, but there's something about when you really get saved and changed inside, boy, you start working, amen? amen. You want to be faithful to the house of God. Listen, Jesus said, he said, my yoke is not, is not heavy. It's light. It's easy. And uh, it says in Galatians, it says that, in 1 John, it says that his commands are not grievous to us. They're not hard to follow. You know what? The commands and the faithfulness is hard to follow when you're in the flesh on a broad road trying to live this life. It's hard, boy. It's hard why? because you don't have the Holy Spirit of God and transformation in your heart. Your nature has not been changed to the one who loves God. It's hard to serve God and love Him when you don't love Him. Amen? Y'all ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you really didn't love or like? Or someone say, I know you ain't through the kids. It was hard to open the door for them. It was hard to really do for them. It was hard to love and, and do what you're supposed to as a, as a companion or even as a spouse. And I, why? Because you really didn't love them. There's some people that you got married you got hard because you kind of love faith a little bit. But when you was a hot teenager, boy, you was in love with such a passion, boy, you loved them. I'm stepping on one toes now, when I was on. <laughs> he was a boy, he was hot, heavy in love, opening the door, buying them cheeseburgers, getting them flying on looking. And, 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 and it was easy because you really loved them. But, friend, I'm telling you, when salvation, when, when religious activity is hard to you, it's because you don't have a real love and zeal for God. You're just playing games. And it's hard. Because when you are really truly saved by the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God is operating in you to help you, to make you want to do what you need to be doing. We need to examine our own motives in life. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Lord. Again, get the Lord, Lord, capital uh, L and, and, and uh, emphasis with two Lords. Have we not prophesied? That means have we not proclaimed your word in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. They've done religious works. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Friend, I'm going to tell you, works will not save you. A lot of y'all believe that because I ain't working. Amen? A lot of Baptists don't believe that. They say, yeah, works can't save you. So I ain't doing nothing, preacher. <laughs> but works will not save you. You can't work for it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is my grace through faith. Boy, when you get that, James said, boy, I'm true belief in him, boy, it'll, it'll work harder than you ever thought about working before you say. We've got to examine ourselves because many are leaning on works and many are leaning on something they did. Many are leaning on a prayer set. Many are leaning on some movement in vacation Bible school. Many did say in Bible school, and I'm thankful for Bible school. But I think we need to be sure when we're leading children to salvation to make sure they understand and quit just patting them on the back, sign the car, pumping them through the baptism, and then throwing them right out there, lost people thinking they're sheep. But there are many who are leaning on works. There are many who are leaning on some baptism. There are many today who, as a child, they were, they were baptized, maybe in the Episcopal Church or maybe in some of the Reformed churches out there uh, in the world that were baptized as a baby. And they think that they have salvation because they were baby dedicated when they were a young child or even an infant. Friend, I'm going to tell you, salvation is by grace through faith. When a lost sinner understands his condemnation because of his sins, he sees Christ and all of his glory and all that he has done, and in their heart, they surrender down and make him Lord of their life, and they repent of their sins, and by faith, they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus. 
And then because of that salvation, then they follow through with baptism. And then they follow through with the Lord's communion. And I tell you, some of those denominations out there, not trying to make a bad relay, though many of the Catholics who believe in transubstantiation, that they believe to some degree in transubstantiation means that when they take the Lord's communion, when they take the, wine, the, the, the juice, and when they take the bread that is symbolic of Christ's body and His blood, when they take that, they think that it becomes really saving grace to them, and that there's some kind of salvation in just taking communion. Friend, I'm going to tell you, I hope you take it all your life. I hope you take plenty of communion. But don't you take communion all your life and not receive Jesus Christ by faith because you will stand one day before God who you serve so diligently and He'll say, Depart from me, you work with me. You'll stand here in all, and then all of a sudden the world will flash before you, and you'll go back to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and God will proclaim it to you. It is by grace, through faith, not of works. There are many today who are looking for salvation. Uh, as many like him, uh, not to keep jabbing, but I'm just going to call it out. There's many in the Church of Christ who, who believe that if only you're baptized, you've got to be baptized, and that's part of your salvation. Friend, can I just tell you, doctrine, and I hold up the Bible from where I get it. It's not my opinion. It's not my doctrine. It's God's doctrine and the Word of God. That it is not baptism in and of itself that is going to save you, but it is when you have been saved by the blood of Jesus, falling on your knees before a holy God, repenting before God, and by faith trusting Him, receiving salvation, and then that baptism is an outward expression of the inner change that has been done. There's no saving grace in, in baptism, in the baptism. There's no saving grace in communion. There's no saving grace in water baptism. There's saving grace in repenting of your sins and by faith through Jesus Christ. Saved. Examining our motives. It's not of works, he says, but there we go down uh, in verse 23. He says, then I will profess unto them. They professed him, but he didn't profess them. And friend, you can profess Christ all you want, but unless Christ is professing you, it will be an eternity in destruction. All of you can profess him. Because you profess him, but it's he professing you. We look and we see in verse 24 that we need to continue that examination of our own motives and how we're working and building even in life and in our whole lives. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever hear these sayings of mine and doeth them. Again, you see the doing that there will always be outward proof of an internal change in the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, I'm going to get it real quick. I'm tired of walking around where you can and I'm tired of people that tell me, yeah, I'm saved, and I see their lives, and I know they're not. I cannot judge any man's salvation. I do not condemn anybody to hell. I don't say, brother, you're going to hell, uh, because I don't know that he is, and I get saved. But I can say that if you continue on the road that you are on, that road will lead you to the devil's hell. But, friend, there are many today who are religious because they were in uh, a, a revival setting when they were in uh, high school because the preachers used to come, the teachers used to lead them, the, the students down to the church during revival time. That's a good thing to do, amen? But there were many that just made quick decisions or followed a friend down to the altar. But they never got really saved. They've never been back to church. They've never been changed or transformed. There is no works or act of showing of Christ being in them, and they think that they're saved. Preach, I'm all right. Preach, I don't even go to church. I do church right here. I pray the Lord I know. Well, friend, I hope that's true, because your outward works are not showing an inward change. And one day that profession that you are doing might not be received by God, and He might not be professing you back. You better prove it. Or you just may lose what you think you have. Examination of our internal motives. We look at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever hear these sayings of mine and do them, I will liken him to a what? A wise man. Well, there's a lot of wise guys and wise girls out there that ain't too wise because they're not doing and obeying the word of God. They make the professions, but they sure ain't following them. And what the Bible says is that they are a fool. We look and see that, what does it say? He said, those that do the will of the Father, that follow through when your internal motives are examined, are you showing a consistent pattern of following God? What does 
that look like? Are you entertaining Bible reading at some amount of time in the week? Are you praying to God daily? Let me ask you this. When you fall into sin, when you say a cuss word, or, or when you fall into sin in some way, does it burden your heart to the point that you say, God, I shouldn't have said that? Lord, I don't want to use myself as an illustration. They say I don't do that as preachers, but I'm just an old country boy preacher. I'm not a hot shot. Can I just tell you that sometimes I get aggravated, and I have been known to hit my finger with a, a, a my thumb with a hammer, and it seems like sometimes I am good and holy, and I just say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've given me there. And biting my tongue from saying what I want to say. But you know what? There's sometimes when I've been in the flesh and I'm aggravated already, and Indian Island Hill's been aggravating me, and the workplace has been aggravating me, or it's hot and sunny outside, everybody's looking at me, uh, but nonetheless, and I get my finger and there's times I can slip up and I say, oh, man. The old man rises up. You know what God does? He slaps me right upside my head before I can even get it out of my mouth. I say, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Is that the way it is in your life when you do mess, mess up, when you do sin? Is there a chasing of the Holy Spirit of God in you? Because that's what an arrow road looks like. When you're on an arrow road, you ain't got no room for slip ups. And when you start to step over here out the wrong way and fall off the road, God gets your hind end good because the Holy Spirit of God is working in you because He's a loving Father. And he's just putting you in discipline and keeping you on a discipline road. But my friend, I want to tell you, for those that are in religion and those who are just lost as tokens go, that's out there on a broad road, well, they can run all over the place. And they can, it's so why they won't even fall off the road. Why? Because they have no self-discipline. Why? Because there's no discipline of God and the Holy Ghost in their life. He's not threatening them because they aren't his child. He says that you'll be wise if you do the word of God and build your house upon a rock in verse 24. A firm foundation. It's a good, solid foundation. You don't want to build your house down right on the beach or right on the sand. That's why they pour cement and rebar to give you a firm foundation so it don't wash out. But what he's saying is the person that professes me, but they don't have outward expressions of the interchange, they're just building wood on top of sand. We know what sand does. It flows and it washes and it erodes. And he says that's foolish. Verse 25, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Notice that it was a house. Notice that it looked like a house. Notice that it was probably engineered to the current specs of Jesus' day and Jesus' time. If it was today, it would be a nice, pretty house, a brick house, or maybe it would have a party plank, and it's got the same engineering, it's still got the same 10, 12 roof, it's got the fancy windows. Maybe it's got, I don't know if it would have shingles, timberline, or if it would have tin this day and time, because both are very natural and very nice today. But there are many houses being built today that look very nice and they look the same. And there are many Christians who have nice vessels, they have nice clothes, and maybe they all look the same. Kind of in some ways, they even act the same. They even go through motions the same. But there are some who are not evaluating their internal motives and they're not doing it for God. They're doing it for great gain or financial gain or for glory or for position. And they're doing it for the wrong thing. And God says, the house is being that it's a nice house, but one day, listen, the wind and the rains is going to be the judgment of God that we see in verses 21 through 23. And it's going to come upon their, their building like a storm. And when the word of God comes through and there's not a proper foundation, the house is going to crumble because the works were in vain. Jesus is going to say, the house crumbled. Couldn't withstand the judgment of God. Because you were upholding it and not Jesus. He says, Apart from me, you work for iniquity. For I never do. But thank God there are those who are faithful. Verse 26 says, Everyone that heareth the saints of mine. Those who hear it, do not only hear it, that hearing there means a response of action into what they're being called to, and that doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man. That is the ones that are fools right there, which build his house upon the sand. And uh, those are those who heard it, but didn't respond the right way. They heard the truth. They heard this message today, but it sounded like people are just like I am on Broadway. That's what we're talking about. They're going to continue. And uh, their house is going to be foolishly built upon the sand. Verse 27. 
and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. But when it came past, when Jesus had ended his sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. They were astonished at his doctrine. And I tell you out there today, that there are people when they hear a message like this, they get astonished on that. Oh, goodness. He preaches as if he knows something. How does he know about eternal life? How does he know about eternal life? Well, Jesus spoke, verse 29, of the poor. He didn't teach like the Pharisees and the scribes, the false leaders who were leading people down the broad road in his day. He spoke all of a sudden with discipline. He spoke with life change. He spoke with examination of your motives, a straight road. In an and he spoke it with authority because he had confidence in what he was saying. You see, the only way that you're ever going to speak with authority, the only way that you're ever going to stand before God with authority is when you have a confidence that is not in the flesh and of yourself. But when you confidently are looking to God in his authority, and when you confidently know that the word of God, that you have responded to God in the right way, and you are living the right way. Because this is his holy living word. The word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was with God and the word was God. Uh, friend, this right here is the knowledge and understanding of God and the will of God for our lives. And today we can, as we examine our motives, as we examine our ways, as we examine our spiritual leaders, may we do it with the word of God. Friend, I want you to understand this as we come to the time of closing. Uh, that messages like this, it causes us examination. It shouldn't cause us great confusion. Uh, for those that are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you're truly saved, this should be a point of examining yourself. And as you're examining the preaching this morning, you're saying, you know what? I, I really believe in Christ. I, I'm not leaning in baptism. I'm not leaning in these things that he's called out. But I'm trusting in God right now. It's not necessarily that you're standing or... Uh, building confidence in a past event, although the day of salvation is a great event and it's something we can remember. But I'm not looking back uh, to when I was six years old when I made a confession of faith and when I went down and got baptized. I'm not looking back to when I came back to God at 20 year old and got baptized again because I had fell in a wayward way and had come back to Christ to ensure my salvation. I'm not leaning back on all that. Those are great events and great days. But what the reason I know that I am saved today and I am confident in my salvation is because right now in my shape, I can look up to heaven with a whole heart and I can say, God, I'm a sinner lost and undone, and I'm trusting you to get me to heaven. You're the only way I'm going to get there. God, I've made you my Lord, and you're still my Lord. And I am confident, not in anything that's been done at work, but I am confident in my faith and belief in this word and the God of this word. And friend, if you're sure of your salvation, it'll be because you have been convinced by the Holy Spirit, you have knowledge of his word, and you are making him Lord of life right now, presently, still making him. You make the Lord of your life. If you die in your salvation, make the Lord of your life. Begin to speak for Scripture. Begin to accept it and talk that belief in faith. God, you said you were true. You said you, you sent it for me. And I believe in my faith right now, Lord. But at the same time, there should be chaos in the soul of one who has never been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. There should be great fear. There should be great examination. Because when you examine yourself, when you examine your motives, when you examine your way, when you examine your leaders, you don't even know the word God yourself. You don't know God yourself. You look at your life and there's nothing to show of your life. There's no faithful church attendance. Would anybody without faithful church attendance have any confidence in their salvation? No. Would anyone who is not at some amount reading the scriptures and praying, praying daily, seek the Lord? Any confidence of salvation? Would anyone on a broad road that is not convicted of their lifestyle, would they have any confidence that they're truly saved? No, they wouldn't. And friend, if there's no confidence today, what I'm telling you today is that the end road is destruction. And the end road is eternal life. And the way that you're born is proof in itself of where you end up.
This isn't a game, and this isn't anything that's just look, they're going through some movie scene, a flower lit field, just passing through, daisies pushing across our hands, and we're just living like no friend. We've got an eternal destination. God has given us a way to get here. There's a path that we can get on righteousness. We're all on the broad road. Friend, come on over here on the good road. On that road. It's a good road. It's a better road. It's a happy road. It's a joyous road. It's an easier road than anything else that you'll ever be on. Are you ready about it? I close as our musicians come and prepare to play softly. Maybe here today, as you've heard this message this morning, there is some doubt in your mind. Maybe you don't have a whole lot of confidence in your salvation right now. Friend, can I just tell you that I want to leave today without full confidence and assurance that I was saved by the blood of Jesus? I fall on my knees before God and I would cry to Him and confess my sins and my faith, believe in Him, and just look up to heaven, go down in my heart, look up to heaven and say, Lord, save me, sir. And say it meaning it, given with the opportunity to give anything you ask for away. You need to be saved by the blood of Jesus. Not only do you need to be saved, but you also need to have confidence. There are some people that are truly saved. But they're not fully surrendered right now to the Lord. They're fighting against God trying to chase them. Like old teenagers, they rebellious teenager against a mom or dad. Fight with the fuss of here. Friend, you'll never be any good for the kingdom and work of God until you can have a confidence in your salvation. You can't walk up to someone and tell them about Jesus if you don't even notice you have Jesus. That's silly. That's a foolish road. That's a broad road. And that's a house that's going to crumble one day. You need confidence in your salvation. Friend, you need to get that right. Not later, not next week. You need to get that right today. Today. On an old fashioned altar. Do your business with God and get right with God. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're just a Christian. Maybe you've got a family, friends, and family you want to pray for. Maybe you want to ask God for wisdom to help you discern spiritual leaders and direction and guidance that you may continue to walk on the right path. Maybe there is some wrong influences that are trying to draw you off of a narrow path and bring you to a broad path of sinfulness. Friend, maybe you want to pray about that. God will give you victory over uh, that influence. Give you power over some stronghold. Maybe there's a generational curse in your life. Maybe your uh, family or alcoholics, maybe your family are very addicted. And uh, that curse is drawing you. You're beginning to be tempted by alcohol use. Maybe you're being tempted by drug use. Maybe you're being tempted uh, by seeing families who have lived in adultery and uh, fornication. Maybe that stronghold, that demon is beginning to operate in your life. Maybe you come and pray for power over that. God break this curse, this against you. You be able to God leads this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your message. We thank you for your word. God gives us assurance today. For those that are lost and so against God, I pray conviction to their lifestyles, that you would draw them unto salvation, Lord God, that they fall on their face and repent. For those who are lack confidence in their salvation, I pray, God, that they would examine today with an examine motives and that they would be sure before they leave this line today, Lord, before they close their eyes now, to be sure to find confidence in their salvation. God, for those uh, that just need some help in life, I pray you give. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We stand and say, you be obedient as God leads you this morning. It's all right.